Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokesh. I'm here with my good friend Judd Weiss, who you may know from his vice presidential run within the Libertarian Party in 2016. But he's someone whose activism goes way back, many years before that. And I've seen a lot of the events that he's hosted around L.A. and had a great respect for how he's conducted himself. But there's something deeper in, in, in this character that, that I really do appreciate that I think shines through to a lot of people in our community. And with some of the interviews that we've done before for Adam versus the man and for the work that I've seen him do within the movement, what I really respect him for is being an, an example, example uh, of entrepreneurship and someone who lifts other people up in that way. And that's something, like I said, you know, I, I want to be an activist activist. I want to be someone who, who encourages other people and mentors and, and, and supports others. And, and I think you've had a, a, a great voice in that uh, as an entrepreneur. So could you tell us, like, what is it that, that you think, if, if, if someone called you, hey, Judd, he's an entrepreneur, what does that mean to you? Ooh, uh, an entrepreneur... I suppose just finds a way to vi bring value to things. And by the way, thank you for that nice intro. I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, bring value to the situations and find a way to extract value out of that situation for everybody involved so that everybody you deal with has a big smile on their face. That's the point of it. If you can make that happen, there's a lot you can do. If you're trying to screw somebody over in, in the situation, well, then, then people learn not to deal with you. But if you can give everybody a big smile on their face, then you're basically like Santa Claus. And, and if you think about it, this is a really important point for entrepreneurs, and, and they never think about this, but the importance of Santa Claus as a metaphor. Because what is Santa Claus when you really think about him? He's the biggest breaking and entering criminal that humanity has ever heard of. Right? I think he's broken into like, what, six, seven billion homes a night, or at least three? At least, like, yeah. Some, some several billion homes. I can't believe night. they haven't caught him yet. Right? And what do p people do in response to this serial breaking and entering criminal? Milk and cookies. They put out milk and cookies. <laughs> Why would they do that? Because Santa is bringing presents. Santa is bringing value. Nobody puts up their guard to presents or value. So the way to think about being a very successful entrepreneur is to try to be a fountain of value, spraying everybody around you of, of value. Everybody just gets sprayed around you. And then suddenly, you become waterfront property. Everybody <laughs> wants a, a, some place near the fountain that's spraying value. Yeah. And then not only that, but you have a lot of people that you know in your life. Not only will that increase the number of people, but just the people that you do know in your life, if you're bringing value to all of them, if you're helping to boost them in some small way, it's not just that that improves your bank account of goodwill, which it does, which is valuable to you, which is great to have. But you boosted all the people around you. Now you have a slightly better network. The more you've improved your network, it's your own garden. The more you've improved your network, the better you have, you have a better network. So cultivate that, not, but, but it's not just that you've boosted that, but you've brought so much goodwill. So it comes back to you. So, you, so people don't realize it's, it's not just generosity and goodwill um, for the sake of it. That's so valuable to you. So the people that are like thieves, scammers, screwing people, they might laugh and say those poor fools that are honest and trustworthy and reliable, they can't get what we can get. They might laugh at those honest people, but I think those poor fools, because they fucked their life. Yeah. They, 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 they've taught people that they are the opposite of a value. They are a problem. And what do you need to do with that? You need to get that out of your bubble, get that out of your universe. So what, the first thing you need to think about is make sure that people want you in their universe, whether it's associates of some sort, but certainly in business, they're gonna wanna have you in that world. And if you're not, re-engineer your approach so that you are. Right. So there's so many ways that it applies, but th for example, I've done that with my camera. I basically come in like Santa Claus and gave presents, really nice yeah. presents to yeah. tons and tons of people. Yeah, so for people who don't know, um, I, I don't know, like 80% of the Facebook profile pictures on, on you know, libertarian social media pages are pictures that he's taken of them at events and, and it, it really is it, it's a gift to every event that he goes to to be able to, to just hey free portrait service and it's yeah. casual and it's like here I just I'm just providing value yeah. so right and because uh, there's like I don't know 35 40,000 Facebook profile photos out there that are mine it's crazy at this point I can't even count but because of that I got 
that spot as VP candidate with the McAfee campaign because all of these people in the Liberty Movement have my name on their profile photo as, as a watermark. And, they, and I try to make these nerds look cooler, one nerd at a time. And there's a ton of them. And they all look better now. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make this scene be something you don't want to avoid but want to be a part of. And so because people have felt really appreciative of that, I had a lot of goodwill over that. And that got me a VP spot with that maniac, McAfee. <laughs> and so I ran with that guy, and I just brought a different perspective. I think for me. messaging, I'm sorry, Judge, you're supposed yeah. to say brilliant maniac, McAfee, right? Brilliant <laughs> maniac. I hope one day to be half the maniac that McAfee is. <laughs> If I could aspire to such a level of being just a half of maniac that McAfee is, I will feel yeah, like... God, we love you, brother. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love him so much. Seriously. That guy, that guy was over and above for me. I'm going to always be grateful to him for the rest of my life. But he is definitely a maniac, and I aspire. He's a maniac that has in, in, influenced me. I, I met an influence of mine, and then I got to run with this guy. And I got the reins to change the whole creative approach to the campaign. And it was all because of this camera in my hand that I was able to go and give a lot of value to a lot of people in the scene and that, that brought me there. So you never know what, what, where it's going to end up, but start spitting out value everywhere. I want to ask you another question about this. One of the, one of the other entrepreneurs in our, in our movement I really respect is Mike Adams, naturalnews.com. Okay. And w when I interviewed him a few years ago, he said, you know, it's not so much about compiling wealth. You know, like there's only so much that an individual can really consume, you know, and you only need so much to be happy and healthy and comfortable and have a rainy day fund and provide for your family and, and have savings and all that. But he said that my measurement of, uh, of success as an entrepreneur is not how much money I make for myself, but how much value that I can be a conduit of. And I think in a way you just sort of like blew away that whole point with your, your, your very opening of this is saying that entrepreneurship is about providing as much value to others. But can you speak to that sort of separation uh, that, that, that I think, I think for a lot of people starting out in entrepreneurship or just starting out, you know, in, in whatever it is they're doing in their life, uh, th there's this fear of scarcity. You know, if I give things away, if I, you know, I, I have to, I have to be an entrepreneur because I want to be rich. And instead of wanting to be a conduit for wealth, how would, how would you, you know, someone starting out, how would you help them sort of get past that psychological barrier? Well, the problem is when they're starting out, the truth is they can't provide too much value. If you're just a noob, you don't know what you're doing in a certain field, you need to build network, contacts, you need to build knowledge, you need to build skill. And so at the beginning, if you don't have much skill, uh, connections, network, you're not, there's not much you can bring to the table. So you need to build that. You, and so you essentially need to go to the gym and build your, up your muscles. Uh, okay. And you have to think of it that way. So that's what really hustling is. Hustling is about figuring out how to build up the value that you can offer. And, and so your point is even then, it's, it's not in making money right away. It's, not how, it's how much can I empower myself. The more value you can offer, the more leverage you have to bring value back to yourself. So you've got to give to get. In, in a free voluntary world, people don't open their, their... In a free voluntary world, there's heavier regulations than government because the regulation is somebody's wallet and whether they open it or not. Immediate accountability. Right, and so in order to get somebody to open their wallet, they gotta be excited to do that. They gotta be willing to do that. So you need to give to get. And, and a lot of people, uh, the, a lot of sales world that just trains how to sell, sell ice to Eskimos, that's the exact opposite of how to s bring value. Sales should be about, the way I think about, is really about bringing value, but the way I think about sales is it, it ultimately, because I'm a, my background is all sales. I'm a commercial real estate broker. I sell buildings. That's how I made my money. And sales essentially is hand-holding. You need to get somebody who's on a safe platform to get off of that platform and to take a step onto another platform that they might not be comfortable with. And in order to do that, you need to make sure that they are definitely going to have a big fucking smile on their face, that they just left their platform, took your hand, and stepped onto a new one. And that's your job. And that's not easy, especially when it comes to real estate, when it's like one of their biggest assets. And I'm trying to get them to sell that, move into something else. Uh, so this is a serious challenge to, to get people to do it. But if you get good at that, if you get good at bringing value to the situation and demonstrating and hand-holding really well and making sure that people have a smile on their face afterwards, uh, then you can do really well with your life. So you have to build, you have to go to the gym, you have to build up your value, your skill, your knowledge, your connections, your network. And the best way to build up your network 
is to bring value to a lot of people. The best way to build up your skills is to push yourself. So this is what people, this is the essential piece of hustling that most people miss. Because hustling some also has a bad connotation to it too. And I, I want to clear up that hustling is about pushing yourself to be of higher value. Value, value, value. I can't emphasize that word enough. That's the essence of it all. And I, I could talk a lot more. <laughs> Can I give you like a little anecdote? Please. So I started commercial real estate. I was 22 turning 23. It's a joke that I'm going to represent anybody on a $6 million property. They look at me and they wonder where my father is, right? <laughs> like This is one of their big assets. Or when their coffee's arriving. Right, right. It was a joke. I'm in my suit. I'm hungry. I want to make money. And uh, I look like, why, why would they give me 6% of one of their biggest assets? Why would they trust me with it? Well, they yeah. didn't, because I, <laughs> I had to build, I had to learn. So for the first six months, I spent all of my savings as a 23-year-old, which was about $30,000, and I had nothing to show for it after six months. I made zero, and I almost gave up, because I'd been trying to put deals together, and I couldn't. And, and I was so frustrated. But the next six months, I made $100,000 in six months. Not the whole year, just in half a year. And then the next year, I was 24, I was turning 25, and I was in the top 10 in the state of California, top 20 in the world at Remax Commercial. The next year, I was number 18 in the world at Remax Commercial. And I, I moved up really fast at the age of 26. And I bought my house in Bel Air when I was 24. I did well. And that was. And then 2007, I left, I started my own thing. And in 2008, shit hit the fan in commercial real estate and real estate world in general. And I started other companies. But, but I moved up so fast. Uh, but before, before I moved up so fast, the, the reason that, the, the one more important thing that people have to realize is that the money in your pocket isn't the only indicator of progress. So when I was about to give up, I was looking at, I didn't have any cash to show for all, the, all that I invested so far. I was like, I'm young, maybe I'm not appropriate for this world, maybe I can't make money in this, maybe I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then I started killing it and everybody started taking me out to lunch to figure out how am I doing it. I went from ignorant to, to like... Guru status. Pretty quickly. <laughs> and everybody wanted to know what the hell am I doing. Well, first of all, uh, when I first started, I had no hope. There was, I didn't know what I was doing. I was ignorant. So I had no skill. I had no contacts. I had no network. Then as I started getting into it more, trying to sell things, peop all these multi, these guys own tons of properties or multimillionaires. They hang up the phone on me. I'm nervous and they won't talk to me and I don't know what I'm doing. And, and I don't like bothering them. And then they, they, they like really rude. And so I was like, how the fuck do I do this? You know, but I started gaining some sense, I started gaining some knowledge, started understanding the property, I started understanding the buyers, the sellers, their motivations. And what I didn't, right before I was about to give up, it was because I was having deals that were slipping through my fingers. And I was getting, like, I was so discouraged because I was like, oh, I almost did this and after six months I've still got nothing to show for myself. But I did. The deals were slipping through my fingers. That's a much better sign than I had no hope. That's an indicator. They're, they're slipping through my fingers. That means I'm about to close. And it was. I was right at the peak of, of actually becoming somewhat competent when I almost gave up. And so you have to look at that. If deals are slipping through your fingers and they weren't before, you've improved. And that's when people give up. Yeah, no, and, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that you yeah. started this. Yeah, I'm crowding you out of the frame oh, here, man. I want you to be front yeah, and center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, that, that you start saying value, value, value and giving yeah. value to others. And I think w one of the most important things in that is that, and, and especially as libertarians, we're already, we're already thinking outside that, well, of course, value is not measured in dollars. How could they possibly be in, in that declining, decrepit currency uh, that's so corrupt, right? And so it's, it's inherent. Crypto. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it, so it's, it's already inherent for us as libertarians to think, to, to, to think outside of the, the dollar box. Right. And, and to see that value and everything else. I'm really glad that you brought that to, to this conversation. Cool. So There's an interesting little anecdote about that. All right. um, did you ever hear the story? I think I might have told you about this. The, the two boys fighting over an orange? No. All right. This is a very key negotiating concept that everybody needs to know. And unfortunately, they're not teaching this for, to third graders. They should be. There's two boys fighting over an orange. 
one says I want it, the other one says I want it. And then they decide to compromise and split it in half. Well, one boy eats the fruit and throws away the peel, and the other boy uh, throws away the fruit and keeps the peel for cooking. He just wanted the peel. Now, that's they, they both they both had something that they valued, but they didn't communicate what was the value. So there's more value to the table than just money. There's other terms of the deal. And so what if one boy was a stronger negotiator, dug his heels in, he's an intense guy, he always gets his way, and he got two-thirds of the fruit, he still wouldn't have done as well as somebody who took a more cooperative approach instead of a competitive approach, figured out what's the real interest behind the other person's position, and gave them 100% of what they wanted, which was the whole peel or the whole fruit. You know, it's funny because this, this is perfect connection with nonviolent communication, which is a big thing for me, is that when someone, you know, you, you communicate observations, then feelings, then needs, then requests. And you might make a request of someone that's based on your presumption, but if you didn't communicate your needs, you might never discover that they have a better way of meeting your needs than what you first request. And I think that's an important thing that, that for entrepreneurs. Do that. People yeah. don't do that. They don't, so when I, Instant gratification, here's a request, here's a request, let's have an exchange, let's, let, you know, as opposed to let's take the time just what are your needs? What, are, what, are, what value am I really providing to you? So I'm a commercial real estate broker. I deal with hardcore, stubborn motherfuckers that get their way whenever they say what, what needs to be done. They bark orders and it's done exactly like they say. And I deal with these guys and I'm in the middle of them, tug of war between two, two of those guys. Two of these guys. <laughs> and, and these deals are impossible because the, their positions are not possible to get together. So I have to ignore their positions. Whatever they say to me, I don't give a shit. I don't care about what they said. I try to figure out what's behind that. So I look at not their positions, I look at their interests. This is how I close deals. I figure out what is the interest behind the position. Now obviously money matters to everybody. So everybody's gonna want more if they're selling and spend less if they're buying, obviously. But there's other terms of the deal. So that orange story isn't as clean, it's never that clean cut. But you can figure out what's going on underneath. And, and if I figure that out, I can figure out a way to take care of somebody's interests and take care of somebody's interests. And now I can get these stubborn bastards together because I know there's value to be had between each other. But if it was just them barking orders and telling them their positions and them fighting with each other, then there's no possibility of a deal. So you got to listen not to their words, but try to figure out in their head what are the interests behind that and solve that interest, not their position. That's a key thing and that helped bring a lot of money in my pocket. And most people don't think like that. So find the value in their interests. Awesome, thank you so much, brother. And, and how can people find you online? Uh, well, I'm most active on Facebook. So Judd Weiss, J-U-D-D-W-E-I-S-S -S is my handle on everything. Facebook slash Judd Weiss, Twitter, Instagram. I have a lot of photos. Are you on Steemit yet? Uh, no, oh, I wanna show. I'm gonna get him on Steemit. You're gonna see Steemit. Okay dot com slash ad Judd Y something later cannabis company so now I'm yeah, selling yeah, marijuana yeah, plug in, dude. this is Lick frame Club. it frame it up man and we have these pre rolls and it's really delicious so we we have that we have some uh, vape pen and we have a few a uh, few cool products this is a, th that was a sample right this is this <laughs> is a uh, vape pen that we've got I don't know if you can see Lick Club it glows lit <laughs> goes lit at the end some cannabis and I think uh, cannabis is our evolutionary future after alcohol a recreational future awesome. so anyway brother I'm a huge fan of everything you do I want you to keep keep uh, kicking ass and I like that you're being more creative on these interviews so thank, thank you, you so much brother